Berman University, Class 2016, and all my brothers and sisters in Christ, it is an honor to be with you here today. I am so excited to share this message with you. Graduates, I became deeply interested and um, excited is the word when I read your motto, faith over fear. And I read your aim because uh, Ephesians 6, 10 through 11, because it shows that God is raising up your class as a generation of believers that transcends faith over fear, who will be strong in the Lord, putting on all the armor of God, so to stand firmly against all the strategies of the devil. Today we are going to look at the most perfect example of this. We are living in a time where more than ever we need to have faith over fear. Together we will take a closer look behind the scenes of the great controversy battle between Christ and Satan in the wilderness so that we fall deeper in love with Jesus Christ today and we understand this unseen war all around us. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, King of the universe, King of my heart, Lord, empty me of self and fill me with the Holy Spirit. Anoint my lips with only your words and fill this sanctuary with your holy angels. In Jesus' precious, powerful name, amen. Now let's peer into this story right before Jesus makes his way to meet John the Baptist. You can follow along in Matthew 3:13. I want your minds to become like a movie screen. I want you to visualize this with me. Something unprecedented is about to happen. Satan wonders out loud, what is Jesus doing? There hasn't been any real change in 30 years of his nauseatingly perfect behavior just the same uneventful, humble lifestyle. Why this sudden action? Where is he going in such a hurry? Satan hastens to summon his top generals to join him in patrolling the Divine One as he hikes from Nazareth down to the Jordan River. A buzzing, excited multitude is gathered on the riverbank. The crowd is listening to John, some preacher fellow, bellowing out, wait, what did he say? Repent ye and be baptized, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Satan's generals dart their eyes towards their evil master. The kingdom of God is at hand. Panic is written all over their depraved faces. Master, this doesn't sound good. Satan smugly replies, Ah, you are all top generals with the wickedest of powers. He's just some lowly evangelist. We'll handle this. I'm sure there's nothing to worry about. Satan's highest ranking admiral leans in and says, oh yeah, look who's getting baptized now. Satan with his evil squad are spellbound as they zoom in closer with bated breath, becoming more and more stupefied by the scene unfolding before them. As John is in the midst of his thundering discourse, he suddenly stops. For a moment, there is silence. His eyes zero in on one man. He has never sensed such a pure and holy character. The crowd noticed the pause. Who's John staring at? A feverish hum of whispers spread throughout the congregation. Who is that guy? He looks so common. They do not recognize their kingly messiah. He was not like King Saul of ancient Israel, who was head and shoulders above the rest. He was simply an ordinary looking man. John yields and leads the Savior down into the Jordan where Jesus is fully immersed, buried beneath the water, Matthew 3, 16. As Jesus comes up out of the water, we are told in Desire of Ages, page 111, that a new and important era was opening before him. He was now on a wider stage, entering the conflict of his life. He exits onto the bank of water with, with water streaming from his garment. 
making little mud pools in the dust. Here, Jesus does a strange thing. He falls on his knees before the engrossed assembly and prays a radical prayer, a prayer that the angels of heaven have never heard of before. Jesus prays with such fervor that the Father would please give him a sign. He pleads that the hardened hearts of men will accept the gift of salvation. And he petitions for power to overcome their unbelief, to break the chains that Satan has tangled them up in. Jesus seems to penetrate heaven as he pours out his soul. He prays with such intensity that tears begin to tumble down his cheeks, mingling with the water from his beard, from the baptism. Up in heaven, the angels encircle and press tightly into God's throne, yearning for God to answer Jesus, to give that desperately needed sign. Desire of Ages, page 112, tells us the angels were so eager to comfort and assure their beloved commander. But no, the Father himself will answer the petition of his Son. The heavens open and upon the Savior's head descends a dove-like form of purest light. The people stood silent, gazing upon Christ. His form was bathed in light. His upturned face was glorified like they'd never seen before. Then a voice from heaven was heard saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3, 17. Jesus is now assured that his first 30 years are acceptable to his Father. John was so deeply moved and with an outstretched hand, he points to Jesus and he says, Behold, the one we are looking for, he's in our midst, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Now it is impossible for us to fully understand or appreciate this intense electrifying effect of that very announcement. For 4,000 years, mankind had been waiting for their Redeemer. Israel had been living under such severe oppression of Rome and longing for their Messiah. And now suddenly, the desire of ages, the great El Shaddai, is here in their midst. Matthew chapter 4. Jesus is now led by the Holy Spirit off into the wilderness of Judah, somewhere south of Jerusalem into a bleak, barren land. He is now on a mission to pray. Satan knows the time has come. The battle that he's been training for, a battle unlike any other, it has to happen now while the Divine One is alone. As soon as Christ enters into the wilderness, his countenance changes. The glory and splendor of heaven that shone on him is now gone. The weight of the world's sins are pressing his soul. His face fills with anguish and sorrow. When the night cloaks the desert in darkness, Jesus has no place to lay his head, no crisp, clean sheets or soft pillow to bring him a little comfort. No, he is all alone with the sound of his growling stomach in this wretched, melancholic place. Suddenly, a glorious, spectacular angel of light appears to the exhausted Jesus. A glowing angel swoops in to console him. As he puts his arm around Jesus, he coos. The Father is so pleased with you. You have done really well. The Father sent me to inform you that he is impressed with your last 40 days. He has decided that your good intentions are good enough. Your heartfelt desire to follow through with the plan, it's sufficient. The Father accepts your intent as the very act itself. You may now return to heaven. Because of your sincere intentions, now man is saved. It is evident to all of us in heaven that you would do it, so go. It's rather interesting that Jesus did not recognize Lucifer by appearance, but Christ identified the evil one by his counterfeit words, and so should we. 
Satan observes our beloved Jesus in the desert for 40 days without any food, and the tempter slowly senses the divine one's true motive. Satan thinks, ah, clever. Food has been my number one success against these humans. It did all begin with a piece of fruit. Interesting that Jesus' first strike against me starts where man left off. Hmm. I bet he's going to refuse any food until he's proven that even appetite can be conquered. Oh, no, you don't, Jesus. It's on. Let the real Hunger Games begin. Keep in mind, the indulgence of appetite had been increasing in strength with every successive generation since Adam. First Selected Messages, page 271, says the human race has become so feeble in moral power they cannot overcome in their own strength. So Christ, on our behalf, was to overcome appetite. He must show self-denial and perseverance. He will fast and pray in preparation because he has three and a half strenuous years ahead of him. After starving for a month and a half, think about it, a month and a half, we can imagine what Jesus must have looked like. He had lost a tremendous amount of weight, mere skin and bones. Satan realizes his master plan is not working and scrambles to devise a new strategy. Do you know why he's scrambling? He is determined to secure his own life and kingdom. He must overcome Christ. The evil one taunts. Are you sure you're God's son? I mean, have you taken a good look at yourself lately? I mean, look at you. The righteous one takes note of his bony, emaciated frame. He has lost almost half of his body weight, and the desert grime clings to his hair and to his beard. Satan sneers. Now come on. God's son is the center of the universe, not you. No, God's son would not look like you. Jesus assuredly responds, you are wrong. I am God's son. I was baptized 40 days ago when I heard the voice from heaven. I am the son of God. Interestingly, the pen of inspiration confirms it was vital that Jesus heard that heavenly voice because the upcoming temptations will be so substantial, so insidious. It is impossible for humans to really know the severity of Satan's temptations to Jesus. Every temptation that seems so overwhelming to you and me is so difficult to resist was loaded onto the Son of God to a much, much greater degree. For you see, Satan is about to twist the most heinous, vicious lie. Lucifer continues to goad Jesus. You are not God's son. Do you know that about 4,000 years ago, there was a rebellion in heaven? There was a great, mighty angel who rebelled against God and his government, and he hated God's law. That angel was cast out of heaven because of his rebellion. He was banished into a dry desert and abandoned left to starve to death. This is why I have been sent to remind you of who you are. You, your real identity. You are that fallen angel. Can you believe it? Satan has the audacity to suggest that Jesus is Lucifer. The tempter continues, Matthew 4, verse 3. All right, then, if you're the son of God, prove it. Use your divine power to turn these stones into bread. You obviously need to eat. Convince me that you are the Son of God. Now, before we comprehend how weighty this temptation is, let's remember that Jesus could not whip out his wallet, pull out his ID. He did not have a driver's license or passport to prove who he was. Just admit it. You are the fallen one. Use your supposed power and show me your credentials because a true son of God would have no problem changing these stones into bread. How easy it would have been for Jesus to 
snap his fingers and cover the desert floor in a sea of bread. But Jesus illustrates to us restraint. Restraint is not always easy for us. Jesus knows that, especially when it comes to instant gratification, yes? Like a beckoning shelf of candy at the checkout stand. Most of us have seen the Million Dollar Super Bowl commercial, you're not you when you're hungry, Snickers satisfies, right? Because somehow when you're hungry, a different brain wave takes over. You don't think straight, you lose your willpower and you become easily distracted. Well, not Jesus. His stomach must have been screeching for any gratification. But there's more involved here than just appetite. This was also a question of identity. This is face-to-face -face combat with Satan over who Jesus is. Our Savior is enduringly strong. Amen? He will not yield to this great temptation because when he looks down the portals of time, do you know what he sees? Your face. He sees your face and he wants you with him for eternity. Feel that, know it. The king of the universe wants you with him for eternity. If Jesus had turned those stones into bread, then he would have ceased to be our example. Do you realize the door to heaven would have been closed shut? He never once on this earth used any power that is not available to you and me. Every miraculous thing that Jesus did was because of his radical prayer life and his use of scripture for victory. All the power Jesus has, he derives from his Father above. When we face temptation, we do not have within ourselves to overcome. We need God's help. We too must pray to have that same living connection. This is our lifeline to victory, friends. Christ will not change these stones into bread. He will not ruin his, the example, for he took the extreme risk in coming to this earth to be our hope and our salvation. So what does Jesus do to defuse Satan's artful trap? Calmly, he quotes Deuteronomy 8, 3. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Faith over fear. Satan recoils in astonishment. What? I expected to engage in a war of minds with him, a battle of wits. But this? Instead of playing my favorite game where I make everyone question and debate each other, Jesus is responding to me with absolutes that allows for zero discussion? Statements of scripture? Oh, how am I going to handle this? You see, Bible passages flow naturally from Jesus' mind. You know why? Because he took the time to memorize. Yes, Jesus memorized. He armed himself with the ultimate power available to you and me. The power in God's words. Jesus memorized scripture as a child, and now when he needs it most, it's there for him to call on. Jesus' life is so saturated in scripture that as he is hanging, stretched out on the cross, his final words are, it is finished. Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. Out of all the epic last words, Jesus could have formulated with his command of language. Surely he could have come up with something original. No, he purposely quotes scripture. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit is Psalms 31 verse 5. And what's more amazing than that? It was a childhood prayer that parents taught their little Hebrew children to pray at bedtime. One of the very first lines of scripture Jesus ever learned was from Joseph and Mary, kneeling down beside his bed. 
What a treasure parents provide by teaching their children to pray. Amen? Amen. That phrase, into thy hand I commend my spirit, is equivalent to now I lay me down to sleep. Isn't it mind-blowing that the king of the universe, as he is dying on the cross, encircled by the intelligentsia, the supreme academics of that day, the Sanhedrin, our king's parting words are that of a childhood prayer. His last breath is, now I lay me down to sleep. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Incredible. His last breath, he breathes out scripture. Now let's rewind back to the wilderness. Satan knew that at least for himself, all was at stake. Who will be the victor? Satan squirms. Ah, so you want to quote scripture, do ya? Then we shall quote scripture. In order to impress Jesus with his superior strength, Satan somehow picks up his emaciated foe and transports him to the pinnacle of the Jerusalem temple. Matthew 4, verse 5. Scholars say that from the pinnacle of the temple to the floor of the Kidron Valley below is a severe drop of 480 feet. So let's try to visualize that. The closest comparable skyscraper that I could find to us right now today is in Edmonton, and it's called the Epcor Tower, and it's at 490 feet. So I want you to picture standing at the edge of that tower, and that's what they were standing on the edge of, with that amount of drop. And Matthew 4, verse 6, for Christ's second temptation, the arch deceiver incorrectly quotes scripture. You know, there's a text that promises he shall send his angels charge over thee, and they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Surely you must believe this promise. If so, I challenge you, jump. Satan was working on sheer presumption. Give the Almighty Father his chance to reveal his divine power through your spectacular rescue. Now don't you ever think that Satan doesn't know scripture. Guaranteed, he knows it better than you. He has had thousands of years to study the Bible, and he knows how to twist it. Today, he is manipulating masses with his counterfeit messages. Satan is substituting every Bible truth with a lie. Satan wants you to believe your doubts and doubt your beliefs. Let's say it again. Satan wants you to believe your doubts and doubt your beliefs. This is why we must know our Bibles for ourselves to the best of our ability. And the Holy Spirit will fill in the rest. Amen? John 8 verse 32 says, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Believe it. Claim it. Christ knew that his Father could absolutely save him, but to fling himself from the roof of a t uh, from the temple because Satan dared him to? That would be an unneeded experiment, testing God's protective care. It would not show his strength in faith, but instead it would show the weakness of his human nature. Satan continues, jump, or do you only follow scripture when it suits you? Jesus responds, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. Faith over fear. Jesus will not comply. But what does he do? He quotes Deuteronomy again. Chapter 6, verse 16. That's Old Testament, friends. Did you know that there are congregations out there that literally tear out that entire section of their Bible? Our Savior, our example, clearly arms himself with Old Testament as his bulletproof shield. <clears throat> so should we. Well, Satan quickly realizes that temptation didn't work either. Hmm. Again, no argument, no long explanation of what the text is supposed to mean, no theological debating. Jesus simply erects the barrier of scripture between them. Now Satan must fabricate a bigger lie yet. Seduce Jesus at his most vulnerable spot. Tender spot. 
for this is the deceiver's last effort that will decide his destiny. By this time, it's obvious who is who. Jesus knows who Lucifer is. Lucifer knows that Jesus knows who he is. There's no more pretending. Which brings us to the third temptation. We are told that the third temptation was the most excruciating. The master of lies transports Jesus again to an exceedingly high mountaintop. And we are told in Matthew 4, verse 8, and Desire of Ages, page 129, that in panoramic view, there's a vision that Satan presents all the kingdoms of the world that have been under his rule. The palaces, the arts, the wealth, the acclaim of cheering fans. He portrays every sparkling gift that this world can give. In all of Satan's generations of experience, he rarely finds a person that will not give over their soul in exchange for this illusion. So with a honeyed voice, Satan offers up flattery Listen, Jesus, you've come all this way, and you love this world, don't you? I tell you what, I will generously give it all to you. You just have to bow down once in front of me, just one time. And then I will relinquish this world and all of its people over to you. The eyes of Jesus for a moment rest upon the glory presented to him. We are told this temptation was the hardest one Jesus had to face. And do you realize the reason why? You. Because he wants you so bad. You are his special creation, thoughtfully made in his own image. He loves you more than he loves himself. Jesus wants to be with you because you are the apple of his eye. And when Jesus is told that all he has to do is simply pay homage to Satan just once, and then we would be his, Jesus stood there on the edge of that mountain cliff, and the Holy Spirit comes upon him, and his mind flashes forward. He sees himself walking into the dreaded Garden of Gethsemane where he will allow the weight of our sins, the sins of the whole world, to almost crush him. Can you picture what that really includes? Every rape, every murder, every lie, betrayal, torture, abuse, the filthiest of filth, the pure white lamb takes it all. Oh, the bloody whippings that he will endure. Christ sees himself mocked, humiliated, even nailed to a degrading cross. Keep in mind, the entire universe is also watching this too. They are just as interested in seeing what's about to happen. And before all the universe, innocent Jesus makes the ultimate demonstration of love. He chooses to go to hell for you and me that we might be saved. Never get the idea that Jesus came to this earth pre-programmed like some computer that he just sort of plods along step by step fulfilling prophecy. No, it wasn't that way at all. Moment by moment, blow by blow, He's harassed, he's tormented, bullied by Satan and his legions of demons. Like being constantly swarmed by pestering flies. Lucifer was never a member of the deity. He's not omnipresent like God. Satan can only be in one place at a time. There is no doubt that when Jesus was born, the adversary made him his personal assignment. The prince of darkness follows the king of kings every step of his earthly life, prodding him to fall at every turn. So when Satan lays this final trap, Matthew 4, verse 10, Jesus remains steadfast with an air of majesty. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. 
I command you, leave me, Satan. Faith over fear. The great dragon was repulsed and silenced. He had zero power to withstand this imperial dismissal. Satan had asked Christ to give him evidence that he was the son of God. <laughs> and in this instance, he's feeling the proof. We are writhing in defeat. The evil one recoils in agony. Suddenly he realized his evil, his own evil forces had come to witness their master do battle. He catches the stares of billions of unfallen angels like spectators at a Roman game. In dreadful fascination, they watch their ruler of darkness shrink in defeat. Satan was compelled to obey the divine commander, Master Jesus. And without another word, he flees from the world's redeemer, Matthew 4, verse 11. Then Jesus falls to the earth as though dying because of the excruciating torture of the experience. Have you ever been tempted to the point, and when the temptation is over, that you fall to the ground dying from the torment? Our finite minds cannot comprehend what Jesus goes through for us while here on earth. Praise God, he's victorious. Amen? Amen. Jesus lies prostrate, clinging to the earth. His last breath is about to exhale. And swiftly, the authentic angel of light, the real Gabriel, scoops Jesus up, lacing his arm around the beloved, God, beloved Son of God in angelic comfort. He provides him with food and nourishment and sweet needed rest. So that when Jesus is refreshed, oh, he rises and he triumphantly walks out of that dark wasteland. Amen? As our conqueror and as our redeemer. Friends, let me tell you that our redeemer lives. Yes, this same man, Jesus, is the one who taught the sun where to stand in the morning. He taught the ocean that it can only come up this far. And he showed the moon where to hide till evening. And his words alone can catch a falling star. The very same God who spins billions of things in orbit. He uses prayer and scripture as his lifeline to victory. What an example. He lives to take away your pain. Call on him. Do we ever need to fear the adversary? Hmm? Isaiah 43. Hmm. A favorite. Jesus personally promises you, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. When thou walkest through the fire, uh, thou shalt not be burned. For I am the Lord of thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. And since you were so precious in my sight, I have loved thee. Fear not, for I am with thee. Let's put that to memory, friends, because we're going to need it. Now come with me as we fast forward 2,000 years. It's 1966. We're flying over Vietnam. And we come to the Hanoi Hilton. It was a prison camp during the Vietnam War, a torture chamber, with beatings and prolonged solitary confinement. Communication between prisoners was absolutely forbidden. And as we make our way down the long corridor of dark prison cells, we find a young man, Captain James E. Ray. He has been taken captive by the enemy, and he is isolated in darkness. With little to no food, his tiny dungeon, dungeon is infested with creepy crawlers, and the smell of feces permeates the air. He can hear moaning off in the distance, and every so often screams of terror. And as his head lays in the muck, on the verge of insanity, wait, shh, what's that? Is that Morse code? Yeah, that's Morse code. What is it saying? 
I will lift my eyes up to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Psalms 121 verses 1 and 2. A powerful surge of life force electrifies his emaciated body because God's words are alive. It brings us power. It gives us hope like no other. And in the opposite direction, somewhere on the wall, sells away, he hears another POW tapping his memorized verse. Captain Ray grabs a broken piece of tile and he scratches the verse into the floor. By the end of several months, friends, Captain Ray and his fellow prisoners were able to memorize collectively the Sermon on the Mount. 1 Corinthians 13, and many of the Psalms. Amen. Amen. Now they had their own living Bible walking through the walls of the prison camp. Those men focused their prayers on the promises of Jesus from that day forward, and those words kept them alive. Upon his release from the Hanoi Hilton, Captain James E. Ray reported to the entire world Bible verses on paper aren't worth one iota, as useful as scripture burned into your mind, where you can call upon them for guidance and comfort. You know there's coming a time, probably sooner than we think, where the only treasure that you may own, it may be the only possession, it is the only possession that no one can take from you. It's what you've stored in your mind. What are you filling your minds with? May it be of saving value. Colossians 3, 16 urges, let the word of Christ dwell within you richly. Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, your class aim, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickednesses in high places. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through who? God. Only those who fortify their mind with God's word will be able to stand in these last days. Jesus has given us an abundance of promises to claim so that we may have victory through Christ. There is limitless power in the it is written. Jesus overcame the roaring lion through prayer and scripture. He showed us faith over fear, our lifeline to victory. No matter what you have done, he has more than enough mercy to cover you. Don't you ever fall for the serpent's slippery lie that you're not a child of God. How many millions of depressed people today believe this lie? When Satan whispers in your ear, give up, you're lost. Just look at you, you're filthy, so unworthy. There's no way you could ever be a child of God. Follow Christ's example. Your answer, Galatians 3.26. It is written, for we are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. God is faithful to his word. Jesus has kept every promise that he ever made. He will finish as victor. There is a colossal war going on all around us that we cannot see, a battle for your worship, and he's fighting for you right now. Just like Jesus' third temptation, who are you going to have faith in? Who are you going to bow down to? It's your choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And if you let him, he will deliver you from whatever you are facing. Whether it be the darkest of addictions, there is hope to carry on. Don't let Satan blind you. Instead, open your eyes wide and look up. And remember that if you have asked, for forgiveness. You're forgiven. Do not give in to that cheap lie that you are somehow disqualified. You are more than qualified because and only because you are in Christ Jesus. 
He will faithfully stand in front of you, and he will fight the foe for you. Our God is able, and he is more than capable to keep his every promise. He will finish what he started in you as a child long ago. There's nothing to fear. Class of 2016, when you embark upon the world, stand up for Jesus and all of his truths, including the three angels' messages. Those are his words. Just as the class, your class motto proclaims, faith over fear. Faith means he is your refuge and fortress. Faith means he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Faith means he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will trust. Faith means his truth will be your shield and buckler. Faith means you will not be afraid of the terror by night. Faith means a thousand will fall at your right side, left side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. No evil shall befall you, nor any plague will come nigh thy dwelling. Faith means he will give his angels charge over you. And faith means he has set his love upon you. Therefore, he will deliver you. And faith means... You are never alone. Jesus is your lifeline. I wish I could better describe him to you because he's indescribable, even incomprehensible. He's invincible and he's irresistible. And when you fall in love with him, you can't get him out of your mind and he will never let go of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you cannot live without him. The grave couldn't handle him, and death couldn't hold him. Friends, the tomb is empty. Our Redeemer lives, and the King of the universe wants you with him forever. Amen.